and uh, <clears throat> I like to consider you know, everything we're doing. And I think it's a good thing for us all to do. Di and I always, in the beginning of a new year, we spend some time praying, just committing the time and the year to the Lord and saying, okay, God, you know, let's put aside any past disappointments or anything like that. Let's celebrate all that God's done uh, and let's move on and let's continue to look forward. And God, what are you calling us to do this year? What are, what, what, what are you saying to me? What are you saying to us as a family? What are you saying in terms of my, my work, my, my, my ministry in the church, my relationships? All these things. Let's commit it all to the Lord. Our lives are completely His. He wants the best for us. So it's a good thing to do. And um, we probably do it subconsciously during the course of the year. We're always praying to God, obviously. But I think at the beginning of the year, it's, it's really good to just sort of do business with God and say, well, God, here we are. Consecrate ourselves. Set ourselves apart again. Hey, Lord, our lives are not our own. They've been brought to the Father. We're in your hands. How can we serve you? What can we do? We want to please you. We want to honor you. And so that's really um, what I like to do. And um, I was been reading, uh, I've been having a Bible reading plan where I read through particularly the New Testament sequentially. And I, I've really nearly finished um, uh, the New Testament and I'll start again at Matthew very shortly. Um, but I got up to the, the book of Jude. Um, and it's only a very small book. In fact, it's only one chapter. And uh, in there, Jude, like uh, a lot of the a lot of their letters in the Bible, are opened up with an exhortation to the to the people of God. And um, and Jude writes that he wanted to, um, you know, um, uh, talk about their salvation. And we love to talk about our salvation. It was a it was a, it's a great thing. But then he he moved on to talk about um, he wanted to talk about giving a warning. And uh, really. Uh, as I say, I want to start the year off on a positive note, but uh, I, uh, I feel this is a, a something the Lord has laid on my heart that I want to share with you today. So let's pray and uh, commit our time into the, into the Lord's hands. Father, once again, we just thank you that we can gather here today and Lord, as a brothers and sisters in Christ, to uh, sit under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, to come under the preaching of the word. And we just open up our hearts right now, Lord, to you to speak to each and every one of us where we're at. Lord, we just thank you that we have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, that you love us all dearly, you've got a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us, and it's our desire to connect with you, to fulfill your purpose in our lifetime. And so, Father, we thank you, we give you all the praise, we give you all the glory today, we commit our time into your hands, we welcome your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so um, the epistle, the letter of, um, of Jude, is the second to last book in the New Testament, right before Revelation. As I say, it's only one chapter. And it was written, like most of the, the books of the Bible, the New Testament books were written to, the, to the, the church of the day, the church in Jerusalem. And as I said, the, the, in the opening passage, um, he writes a, a general exhortation, and he was going to cover the topic of the salvation we share. And, uh, but then he said, but I felt compelled, he said, to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once and for all entrusted to God's holy people. So he really changed the subject. He said, oh, we're going to talk about our salvation, but really I want to talk about contending for the faith. And that is, I guess, the name of my message this morning. It's contending for our faith. Um, it was written and entrusted to all of God's holy people. And that's us. They're the saints. We are God's holy people, the Christians. Now, Jude, um, I thought, man, Peter, you don't actually know who Jude is. I think I better find out who this Jude guy was. Who knows who Jude was? Anyone got an idea? I don't see many hands going up. We should study these things, okay? It's not doctrine, but it's good to know a little bit about the, uh, the writers of the New Testament. Jude is short for the name Judas, uh, okay? And, um, uh, but they, he's, he's, he's called Jude, um, but he had other names. He was Judas, and m m many think that general theologians would say that he is uh, in the, uh, one of the 12 apostles, there were two Judases, you may recall. There's Judas Iscariot. He's actually, in most of the recordings in the Gospels, um, they changed his name to Thaddeus because they didn't want him to get it mixed up with the other Judas. And that's probably a good idea. <laughs> so um, it's, uh, it's, uh, he's also referred to as Judas. Jude's just a shorter form of that. Um, but you also see him referred in the Gospels as Thaddeus. And so that's the general thought that he is one of the, one of the 12 apostles. He's also referred to as the brother of James. Now, uh, also, Jesus had a half-brother, James, and it's thought that he could have well been a, a half-brother of James, which would also mean he's a half-brother of Jesus Christ. So um, regardless of that, his book is in the Bible, and it's very important. It is God's word, and it is God's word for us today. Even though it's only one chapter long, it is uh, there for a reason, 
And that's what we're going to look at today. So let's look at it. Jude, as I say, there's no chapters, so it's just verse 3. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write to you and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted, entrusted to God's holy people. You know, he was going to celebrate the salvation, and it's great to do that. But we must also remind ourselves that uh, we've got to do more than that. We have to contend for our faith. And I believe today, and in this era that we're living in now, more than ever. Um, I don't know about you, but it's, it's very obvious to me um, that uh, we're seeing rapidly changing times and uh, <clears throat> in the last decade. And there seems to have been an accelerated, it's not just the normal momentum that we've seen probably for, that's been happening for years, I guess, but really like in a real acceleration away from biblical values and the traditional Judeo-Christian way of life. And uh, it concerns me. Uh, in fact, I believe that our whole biblical worldview that we hold so precious and that the Western civilization has really been built on is under a major, major attack like never before. Uh, we're seeing rapid, what we would call, secularization, uh, which has brought about just a whole loss of, of, of the whole moral direction of society, a loss of meaning, a loss of reason even for doing things. Um, its uh, philosophy seems to have you know, replaced Biblical, uh, biblical truth. And morality now has become very subjective. It's just whatever people think is okay. And then we're getting, in fact, what we're getting even worse than that, we're getting moralizers against morality, saying, well, you shouldn't be saying those things that were once given moral standards in our society. Um, and then we've got the whole political correctness that's now come in. These things are a real danger to us and a real danger to the church. We hear the word, we're a secular society, and I talked about secularization because that's what's happening. Secular society, I thought, well, what is really the meaning of that? Um, and so uh, uh, for those who don't know, secularism basically is a, a rejection of religious beliefs in the government and in the affairs of a nation. It's religion, and in our case, Christianity. It says that our beliefs have no place any longer in deciding laws, values, or behavior in a modern society. That's what secularism is. That's really what it says. And our government would say that we are now a secular nation, and we can see that in the way that we, you know, the laws of the land and what's been, and what's been happening. And, and what it does is it, it, it um, produces a society, really, that has got no more moral direction. So therefore, we're open to perversion and distortion, um, and where everybody's really free, free to live to their own pleasure and their own self-centeredness and, um, and their own perception, I guess, of, of what reality is. Uh, traditional values that we've always, and accepted truth, are, are being replaced rapidly by secular thinking. We're seeing it happening right before our eyes. Moral boundaries are going. The restraint are being removed. And as a result, we're going to head down, and the Bible talks about it, a road of basically lawlessness, what the Bible calls lawlessness. And then you throw in all this new age thinking where people are thinking, oh, no, there is a spiritual side there. Now, new age is basically a pseudo-spirituality, and here's the key thing, but without Jesus. But without Jesus. That's really how you define new age. Yes, they think there's something spiritual there, but hey, don't mention Jesus. Anything but, and you'll see all forms of it. So we're seeing that through secularization, through the New Age movement and thinking, these things are growing and growing in rapid influence around the world, particularly, as I say, in New Zealand uh, and probably other Western nations. And whereas the Christian worldview is viewed more and more now as marginal, it's viewed with disdain, with skepticism even. And we're seeing this happening before our eyes. Um, <clears throat> in this century alone, just as I say, the last 20 years, we're seeing rapid change in even what it is to define what a human being is. Um, what sexuality and what life and what home and family are all about. Just look you know, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the rapidly changing views in, on sexuality. And they're even promoting it now in our, in our educational system. Um, it seems that our whole moral compass is just Heading in a, in a crazy direction. 
you know, I don't know about you, but, you know, you, for a while they've been trying to promote and, and give, you know, um, uh, credence to the homosexual way of life. And we had the LGB thing, and then it's the LGBT thing. And now they keep adding a letter every week. I, c I can't keep up with it. And there's all these categories, and I'm going, man, this is weird stuff. And yet it's been normalized. That's what we're up against. This is an attack on our faith and what we believe. Um, <clears throat> you know, actually, just talking about that gender thing, um, by blurring the gender lines that they're currently doing, really, when I thought about it a lot, it, it actually comes down to attack um, and defacing the very image and nature of God because we're created in his image. And then you throw in other things. I don't want to be too pessimistic and negative, but I'm just painting a platform here to know what we've got to be dealing with here, church. That we're dealing with, as I say, you know, we, we were before Christmas we were talking about it a lot, about the legislation that's currently before our government with um, uh, trying to promote euthanasia, the liberalisation of the abortion laws. Uh, and it's all about devaluing life. And, but God, it's not God's original plan. God is the giver of life. And so... Um, uh, th those matters are, are, are of extreme concern. Then you throw in this radical uh, climate change thing, this environmentalism thing. Now we have to be, we should be the best stewards of the climate that there is, of the planet there is as Christians. But there's a, there's a, this movement now is gaining, it's becoming like a religion. It's virtually a religion. Um, and, it, um, and it's elevating really virtually nature above people. We're, we're, the, we're the bad guys and the, the, we should worship the planet rather than God. Um, it's a real thing that is happening, that we worship of the creation rather than the creator. But I want to tell you, if you're concerned about climate change, and I guess we do, we need to be concerned about our planet. We're good stewards. We're, we're, God's called us to take dominion and be stewards over the planet. But you don't need to worry. Don't buy into this fear that the earth's going to just... God's in control. We're, there's enough in this book that tells us about his plans for planet Earth, and he's the one in control. So the world, the world is not going to end tomorrow. It's not going to disintegrate. God is in control. And uh, Jesus is coming back soon, and then all things are going to be restored in due time. So don't get panicky and worry and buy into all this fear mongering that's going on about, uh, about the environment. Um, we, yes, we need to be good stewards. There's people, are well-meaning people, don't get me wrong, but we don't want to buy into the, into the propaganda and, and, and the fear, particularly the fear regarding um, this whole um, climate change business. Uh, and then, as I say, we've got all this political correctness coming in now where you just can't offend anybody you can't say anything in fact we've got to guard church you've got to be informed andrew little a member of the parliament is uh, currently got a, a law that's ready a bill ready to go before the house about hate speech and i tell you pastor stephen's a lot more bolder than i am he, he speaks out and in some of the messages last year and it's already happening in scandinavia and other countries where pastors are being head up and saying no you're inciting hate what you're saying is not true, but it's not. We're just saying what the Word of God says. We love all people. It's not about, but we're just saying what the Word... Well, this hate speech comes in, I tell you, it's going to be a real threat and attack on uh, true ministers of the, of the Word. And so we need to resist these things. It's, uh, it's amazing. And I love uh, Margaret Court. She's in the, in the Margaret Court, most of you should know, the greatest woman tennis player of all time. She's uh, an Australian. She's a pastor. She's actually ministered here. She's the pastor of the Victory Life Centre in Perth in Western Australia. Wonderful woman of God. And um, she's been a pastor there for years and years and years. She hasn't changed. She gets up, she preaches the word of God. But because of her fame, they latch onto it. They say, oh, Margaret Court, she hates homosexuals. No, she doesn't. All she's done is taught what the word of God says. And if people ask her, which they often do because of her status... What do you think about this? She just says, well, what do I think? This is what the Bible says, therefore that's what I believe. And then all of a sudden she's labelled as a hater, as a, as a, as, as, as a, you know, a, um, a racist, as a whatever it might be. She's given all these labels, but it's not true. She's, she's done. In fact, if what she did and what she said 30, 40 years ago when she first started ministry, have said they're all going, yes, Margaret, great, that's wonderful. She has, and now they're saying, oh, no, you, you, you hate, you can't say that. And she's copped absolute flack like you wouldn't believe in Australia. 
and uh, the Australian Open, uh, the big tennis tournament's coming up very shortly, and uh, she's got a, 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 there's a stadium there named after her, the Margaret Court Arena, and they're wanting to change the name of it. They're wanting to, they don't want to honour her there. Fifty years since she's done her, you know, since she won all her big tournaments, they were going to give it, and so there's a big controversy in Australia. We need to pray for people like Margaret Court. We need to pray for people like Margaret Court. Um, and, you know, so I don't like all the stuff that's going on. We shouldn't like it. Um, and, uh, you know, it seems in some ways that we're losing the battle. But I'm not afraid of it, church. And we're not to be afraid of it. The Bible warns us that in the last days, these things are going to happen. And it's going to be like that. So it should be no surprise. Let's have a look here what Timothy says, uh, what Paul says in, in, sorry, in 2 Timothy. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. This is Paul speaking. He says, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. Everyone say last days. That the days we're in. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. All about self. All about self, self centeredness, trying to do life without God. And that's what we're seeing. And that's what secularism is trying to solve the world's problems through human wisdom and human effort. It's exactly what secularism is. And our challenge is not to get caught up in it. Um, because the media, I tell you, they're right on board with it. They're right on board with it. This thing has been promoted knowingly and unknowingly right across the spectrum in our society today. And so we're not to be caught up in it and not to think, oh, well, that's what everybody's thinking. It must be okay. God's word hasn't changed. The standard that we're to live to does not change. So we need to be strong because there's a tide that's coming against us and has been that's getting stronger and stronger. So we need to be stronger and stronger to resist it. Um, and that's really what I want to talk today. We need to take a stand for biblical truth. In other words, we need to contend for our faith. And uh, to uphold the Christian values. We're, re we're representatives of Jesus. I'll talk about that a little bit further later on. We are supposed to be the, the signposts, the billboards of truth in our nation. And, uh, but what we're standing for is becoming more and more unpopular. And so uh, we're going to cop some flack. But we're not to shrink back. Once again, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Paul warns again. He says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And that's what we're seeing in our day. We're seeing, in fact, Isaiah talks about it in Isaiah 5.20, doesn't he? He says that the day will come where they'll declare good evil and evil good. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing that in our, before our very eyes. And, um, uh, but our convictions matter. Our words matter. And our actions matter, church. We can make a difference. We need to stand. Uh, that's why I think someone like Margaret Court, who's prepared to speak up, is an absolute hero. That's why Pastor Stephan is an absolute hero, because he speaks up and he doesn't hold back, doesn't water it down, doesn't compromise it. And that's why it was good. That's why it was that march before, um, before Christmas. We went in there thinking, well, what's the point? We're not going to make any difference. No, we have to do what we can do. So you're not always able to do everything, but do what we can do. So we went along. We went to the march. We said to the politicians, no, no, no. The unborn child matters. He's God's creation. Don't destroy it. Don't make it easier for these babies to be killed. So we make a stand. Our actions matter. Our words matter. Our convictions matter. But it's not just, a, as I say, a single issue. We're copying this attack and this assault on our Christian way of life and the Christian values and God's principles on many, many, many front. Um, and, of course, ultimately, it's a, a demonically inspired uh, uh, strategy, if you like. <clears throat> but we know that God is building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Amen? So that's good. 1 Peter says, 1 Peter verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 9 says this. It says, You are a chosen people, that you are a royal priesthood, that you are a holy nation, you are God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his glorious light. 
We're chosen, church. We're a royal priesthood. We're all priests. We're priest ministers to God. We are a holy nation. We are holy. We're separate. No longer be conformed to the things of this world. Come out. Be ye separate, the word says. We're a holy nation. We're set apart for God's purposes. So let's do our best to uphold them and do all that we can. We need to contend for our faith. And as I say, not be swept up in this tide, it seems to me. It's more like a tsunami, really, of, uh, of deception and ungodliness. Anyway, let's get back now to the book of Jude and look at, uh, look, look, look at what he has to say about this. Because he's got some answers <laughs> that can help us in this, uh, in this fight. Jude, as I say, verse 3. Let's look at that again. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write to you to urge you contend for the faith that was once and all for all entrusted to God's holy people. And it's like a warning here. So the faith is the message of the, uh, of the gospel and that was under attack by false teachers who are spreading heresies. Um, and he urges, Jude urges the readers to contend for the faith um, against those who seek to undermine and erode it. Now the word here, the Greek word contend, um, really doesn't, uh, in the English, doesn't do justice. It is actually really probably better translated contend earnestly. So there's an emphasis here, contend earnestly. And that usually describes, is used in a context of an athlete training to, uh, to, to compete and to win. And you know what happens when an athlete goes into serious training? They've got to work hard. They've got to sacrifice. They've got to suffer a bit. It takes some effort. And this is what the word contend here means. In the Amplified Bible, um, they translate it as to fight strenuously. So they use the word fight strenuously. Once again, it's, it's talking about effort. It's talking about um, a, a great, a, not a passive word at all. Not a passive word at all. Fight strenuously for the defense of the faith. Contend means to have to um, deal with something difficult or unpleasant. Okay? It's not just cope. It's contend means to deal with something difficult or unpleasant. And that's what we're having to contend with, something very difficult and something very unpleasant. It means to struggle against or to take on. As I say, it's not a passive expression. And it's not a one-time effort. It's an ongoing process. And so Jude wants all believers to contend earnestly for the faith. A true contender vigorously endeavors to win the competition, not holding anything back. And, uh, of course, in this case, our struggle ultimately, well, we've got these issues here, but ultimately it comes back to, um, to the uh, defending the name, the purposes, and the truth of Jesus Christ and his teachings. And it's entrusted to us, God's holy people. That means it's not just the Christian leaders. It's not just your Margaret Courts. It's not just Pastor Stefan. It's up to each and every one of us. We're all called to defend the truth of Jesus Christ. And we can make a difference, but we need to fight strenuously, church. Uh, we can't be passive about this. Um, God's word, you know, God's word does not change. And it's relevant today as it's always been. And just because society changes, as I said before, God's word doesn't change. And it gives us the, the full message of truth. We can't water it down. We can't try and mold it into what society thinks now is acceptable. It does not change. He does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, the word tells us. And Paul, we're actually warned in the word many places, not, do not change the word of God. Do not add to it. Do not alter it. And Paul said that in Galatians uh, chapter 1, he said, you know, do not pervert the gospel of our Jesus Christ with new and different teachings. God has spoken, and, uh, and while the Holy Spirit can certainly bring out and reveal more truth from, uh, from the written word, we can't add to it, we can't change it, we can't bring in special revelation uh, that, uh, that uh, we feel is relevant for now. I remember going to a lunch uh, a couple of years back with some Christian leaders in our city here. Good people, good man. And I was talking to one particular man. He's a real nice guy, and he means really, really, really well. And he has a heart for God. He loves Jesus. And we were talking um, about the, the, uh, the, the challenge it is for the churches and how to deal with the whole um, uh, alternative lifestyle, homosexual lifestyle, and so on. And what do, you, what do we do about this? We want to love people. We want to help people. And um, he... Uh, he after we chatted for a while, and um, he said, look, I've been wrestling with this now. And he says, I, said, I think, I think God, God's okay with it now. I think God has changed his mind. And, and, he, and, he, meant re and he was sincere. 
And, and, and I know this is a church leader, and, and I'm saying, this is what exactly, though, what Jude is warning us against. Now, he means well, and I'm not criticizing for it, but he was just trying to accommodate. How can we, you know, we don't want to marginalize these people. We want to be inclusive, and we do. But we can't change the truth to do that. There are other ways. And so uh, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was flabbergasted. And, I, and I, I challenged him a little bit on it, but at the end of the day, I didn't want to get into a big debate with him. But it was, it was just interesting to see. It was interesting to see, that's for sure. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, additional teaching, special revelations, they're to be rejected. Just because society's changed doesn't mean God changes. He hasn't. And uh, as I say, ultimately, the truth that we're contending for is the truth of God's word, uh, and the truth that, uh, of Jesus Christ, his righteousness and his lordship. We need to defend the faith. Uh, because few others else will. If we don't do it, who else is going to? I mean, it's up to us. Um, it's our job as the church of Jesus Christ. And, you know, we need to be informed. But I think more than that, really, what we need is boldness. We need courage um, to, do, to do that. We can't be passive. We have to know what we believe, what we stand for, who we represent. We need to be deliberate, passionate, and committed to the cause. And it's not going to be easy. It's not easy now. Uh, I've had cases where I've been challenged and when talking to somebody, people think that, you know, you're a, you're a weirdo. So it's, uh, it's not going to be, it's not going to always be easy. Uh, look here once again, Paul um, talking and speaking to uh, Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 this time, verses 1 to 5. And he says this, In the presence of God and of, the, and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, and in the view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. So this is what he's saying. I give you this charge. This is an exhortation. I give you this charge. Preach the word and be prepared in season and out of season to correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come, and this is what we're talking about now, the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And they will turn their ears away from truth and turn aside to myths. That's what's happening. Evolution is a myth. Turn aside to myths. But he said, you keep your head. In other words, be, think about this. Know what you're doing. Know what you've got to do. Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist and discharge all the duties of your ministry. And that's the same to us. We are, if it gets tough, suck it in. We've got to endure it. Do the work of evangelists. Doesn't mean that we have to be evangelists. We're not all evangelists, but do the work of an evangelist. In other words, be prepared to share our faith and discharge all the duties of your ministry. You think, well, I'm not a minister. Yes, you are. We're all ministers. We're all ministers. We're ministers in our family. We're ministers in our workplace. We're ministers in, in the community that we're in. We're all ministers. We're all carriers. We're all representatives of Jesus. So we're all ministers. So it's going to be hard, and we will certainly... Certainly, we will, we will be opposed. But as 1 Peter 3.14 says, For even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. You're a blessed people, okay? So don't worry about it. You're blessed. Even if you should suffer for what is right, be blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. Do not be frightened. So it takes a bit of bravery. It takes a bit of commitment. The question is, who do we serve? Who do we fear? God? Or man? That's a question I've got to ask myself. I don't want to be unpopular. I want to be people to like me. I don't want to say something that's controversial necessarily. But there is a time and a place. I'm not sure we go around with a placard every minute of every day. Time and a place. When the opportunity comes, we have to make our stand. We have to do what we can do. And so that's what I'm talking about here. We want to be like, and I'll just finish with this, uh, this first section here with a, uh, another um, scripture that Paul wrote to Timothy. And then when Paul is coming to the end of his ministry, we want to be like this. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. That's what we want to be able to say about ourselves, don't we? And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And that's the day we go to be with him. Not only to me, but all, that's us, who long for his appearing. We've got a limited time here, church. We've got to make the most of it. And we want to hear, be able to say what Paul says at the end of it. Hey, I fought the full good fight. I've kept the faith. Now there's a crown of 
waiting for me in heaven. So, contending for our faith. I've talked to enough about why we should do it and uh, what's been going on and the reason we should do it, but uh, how, do we, how do we contend for our faith? What are we supposed to do? Um, so let's read in Jude a little bit further. Uh, coming back to Jude 3, and this time also moving into verse 4. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once and for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals, here it moves on to verse 4, for certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ as our only sovereign and Lord. Now, there are two facts here, basically, that that Jude is mentioning and is focusing on. First of all, he says, for certain individuals whose condemnations was written about you long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who have perverted the grace of God for license for immorality. So he, first of all, is opposing these people that are sanctioning immorality. They pervert the grace of our God for a license for immorality. And the second issue is that he calls them out on their rejection of the deity of Jesus Christ. They deny Jesus Christ as our only sovereign and Lord. And I believe myself, when thinking about this, when I was reading this book, uh, reading this stuff uh, earlier on, I thought, said to myself, yeah, I believe these are two of the greatest issues that we're facing right now. The first one is a morality issue. So I think the first thing we need to do, as I've been already talking about, is to stand up for righteousness. Stand up for righteousness. And by that I mean to make a stand for what is right. What is morally correct. Or more specifically, really, what I'm saying is, and what I think he's saying is, to stand up for what is right by God's standard. That's really what righteousness means in a simple way. Right standing with God. So we want to stand, we want to, we want, we want to stand up for what is right um, by God's standard. And we should oppose those who pervert the grace of God for a license for immorality. Firstly, we've got to live it ourselves. We need to practice it ourselves. Obviously, we've got to live right ourselves. As as 1 Timothy 6.11 and verse 20 says, it says, but you man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing opposing ideas that is called knowledge right now in our time. He said, turn away from this. Pursue righteousness. Now, that does not mean we've got to earn our righteousness. We've all been made perfectly righteous through our faith in Jesus Christ. All right? So that imputed righteousness, we're perfect in God's sight. We're heaven bound. There's no problem about that. But we've got to see that outworked in our lives. We must, up, we must live it. Um, and uh, we must uphold the righteous standard that God requires. And we must more than just live a righteous lifestyle, we must stand up for it. We must make a stand for what is morally right. As I say, we can't be passive. Let's have a look about uh, a couple of scriptures that, that bear this out. In Proverbs 28, 1, it says, The righteous are as bold as a lion. So we shouldn't be timid. People think that Jesus was a timid man. No, he wasn't. You look at the example in the temple when the money changes and and they were selling and trading like a marketplace in God's house, the temple, the temple. And Jesus was, he he wasn't just angry, he was steaming mad. And he got out there and he made himself a whip and he went in there and he upturned tables and he beat them and he flogged them. That's not a timid guy. That's not a timid guy. That was righteous anger for the sanctity of God's house. And so um, we need to be bold. Jesus was bold at the right time in the right place. We need to be in the time and place also, be very bold. And I like what um, I look at what the book of Proverbs says in uh, chapter 25, verse 6, 26. It says, like a muddled spring or a polluted fountain is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. Hey, my turn. You might not know that scripture too well. I thought that was quite good. A muddied spring and a polluted fountain, in other words, they can't. Well, they're not producing anything of life, are they? They're, they're contaminated. Um, and that's like a righteous man. If we give in before the wicked, we're like the polluted fountain, like the muddled stream, spring. 
So in other words, we shouldn't just be quiet and roll over. Oh, well, that's just the way it is. What can we do? It's just life now. No. No, we can't be passive about this church. Now, while we can't and we don't want to necessarily try and force our values and our morals on other people, but we can certainly stand up for them, can't we? And we should do all we can to continue to advance, I guess, uh, the biblical values, knowing, and a sincere belief, that's what I believe anyway, that they are the best way for society to go forward, to have a healthy society, uh, that they promote God's plan as the best plan, and that it promotes the, the general welfare and, and is, the, is the best model for having an orderly and safe society. You know, societies that try and um, attempt to produce their own moral code on, on human rationale, um, you've seen it time and time again. Saw so it with communism. It, can't, it doesn't produce a better society. In fact, the exclusion of Christian principles and values um, generally will lead to less freedom. It will lead to unlawlessness because uh, there's no foundation. No foundation to build on. There's no compass. Who decides what's right or wrong? And so people are just open to the sway. If you, if you, how can you get somewhere if you don't have a, 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 a target to aim at? Well, there's no target. It becomes totally subjective, and that's what we're seeing right now. But we can make a difference, church. You can make a difference, um, in, in your, as I say, in your families. Absolutely, you need to uphold righteousness and make a stand for righteousness in your own families. You're all ministers there, absolutely. But also in your workplaces, uh, also in your social groups, people you encounter. We can make a difference. If you're in a, in a school committee, for instance, you know, that's a fantastic place to be able to promote our cause and uh, uphold our values. So we need to model it. We need to live right. Otherwise, we're hypocrites. Okay? Um, but we need to stand up. We need to contend for our faith. Everything that our faith um, uh, demands, everything it represents, everything it requires. And if, I'll give you a real practical thing now you can do. Uh, you've all heard of Family First. Uh, Bob McCroskey, it's a fantastic Christian-based ministry. They are flying the flag on many of these issues for us in this nation. If you want to, and I would encourage you to uh, stay informed about what's happening right now as bills coming up all the time into, into the government, uh, as lobby groups are moving, these guys are on the forefront. They know what's going on. They provide very balanced perspective, particularly from a Christian point of view, for us to be informed. So if you're not already, go onto their website, familyfirst.org.nz, familyfirst.org.nz. Go on there and um, have a look at some of the, the information they've got. But more importantly, subscribe. And then you'll get emails from them. Okay? And these will provide prayer points for you. These will provide just information for you that you can... Then also, you'll think, well, oh, this is what's happening. I don't know how to answer that. I don't know. I wouldn't know what to say. How could I put forward, a, put forward an argument for that? Well, here, it'll give you... It'll give you the Christian perspective and it'll give you the words. You think, right, okay. Oh, good, good. Now I understand. I can, this is what's what I can say when that issue comes up. Very practical. Because I think a lot of us do nothing because we're not sure what to do. So go familyfirst.org.nz. There are other good ministries around and good websites, but that, that's one. We support them as a church here. Uh, we give them money to fund what they're doing. They're doing a marvelous job. And um, pray for them and uh, get involved that way uh, at least. So that's the first thing we need to do. We need to stand up for righteousness. As I say, it's a, um, it's a, a morality issue. We're opposing those that pervert the grace of God for a license for immorality. The second thing that uh, Jude um, mentioned was their rejection of the deity of, uh, of, of Christ. They deny that Jesus Christ is our only sovereign Lord. So actually, everything that we're contending for in the faith is based on him. It's all about Jesus. Really, at the end of the day, it's all about Jesus. And actually, when you look at what's driving all these agendas and all these people, and some of these people are well-meaning. Some of these people are well-meaning. We're talking about a demonic struggle here. We're talking about demonic forces. We're talking about a plan from hell itself. And ultimately, behind that, is the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist. I just want to talk a little bit about this. We all heard in Revelation that the end days there's going to be this, the, the mark of the beast and the, 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 uh, the Antichrist. We're talking about a specific person as the Antichrist. 
the Antichrist that's going to come and try and set up himself as God and uh, bring the whole world under his control. And then, of course, we know that Jesus is going to come and destroy him. So um, I'm not talking about the person of that particular Antichrist. Uh, I'm talking about a spirit of Antichrist that it is in operation and always has been in operation in the world. The word Antichrist uh, is broken down into two parts, Anti and Christ. Christ, of course, is Messiah. And we know that the Christ or the Messiah is Jesus. So we say anti-Jesus is really what we're saying. Anti means, of course, against, but it also means in place of, in place of, in place of. And so what they're trying to do is usurp, doing everything they can to usurp the lordship of Jesus Christ. And that's what a lot of these agendas that we're seeing are all about. It's taking Jesus out of the equation. So um, they, uh, you see it in other religions. They try and set up other gods. But more importantly, the more significant thing that we're dealing with is philosophies and belief systems that, uh, that exclude uh, Jesus Christ. It's the spirit of Antichrist. Look what 1 John 4.3 says. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. So we're not talking about the Antichrist, the person that's going to come right in the last days. We're talking about the spirit of Antichrist that was around then, has been around ever since, and we've seen it. If you look at human history, you look at all the terrible things that have happened and a lot of the agendas that have happened in the world, demonic forces are behind it, and in particular, the spirit of Antichrist. See, we're not warring. The Bible says we don't war against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, authorities, and dominions, and rulers in high places. We're talking about a spiritual battle, and we're talking about demonic forces. Our enemy is not the extreme liberal left, or the alt-right, or any human entity. Our true enemy is the spirit behind it, the spirit of Antichrist. That is really what is, is feeding all these agendas, all these destructive forces, um, and they're seeing the increase in this immorality and the perversion, really. It's a perversion of God's created order, is what we're seeing. So these demonic lies and deceptions are ultimately, though, designed to... Undermine the deity, the humanity, and the lordship of Jesus Christ. You know, the devil is not that smart. He's pretty smart, but he's not that smart. We read the Bible, his plans are exposed. You read when Jesus was before he grew up and when he first went into ministry, before any of the Gospels, he went out to the wilderness, you recall. And he went out and he was tempted. This was before he went and started his ministry. And so we see here the first encounter directly in the New Testament between the devil and Jesus Christ. And what were the things that the devil said to what was the thing that the devil said to him? He said it to him twice. He said, If, if you are the Son of God, and that's what he's after. If you are the Son of God, do these things, do these things. If you are the Son of God. And that's the same thing that's happening today. Is Jesus really God? Is he really God? Did he really come in the flesh? Did he die? Did he rise again? Did he pay away for salvation? Well, the answer, church, we know is yes. But that is really ultimately behind it all that is what is under attack. And so remember, Jesus is God. That is the core of the Christian faith. People say to me, and that's why the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses, once again, well-meaning people, but deceived. That's why they're not part of the Christian church. The core of the Christian church is the thing that we all must believe is that Jesus is God. Jesus is Lord. Amen. And they don't. They, they think he's the son of God, and they think there's a difference. But we don't think there's any difference. Father, Son, and Spirit, one God. And so that's what sets the Christian church apart. And that's what we must ultimately stand for. The core of our faith, that he died, that he rose again, that he provides salvation for all who will believe on him and call on his name. So we are representing Jesus we need to uphold his name, his teachings. We need to bring him glory. And that's how we do it. Jesus really is the only answer for society's woes. He, we know that. Man can only be changed from the inside out. All these external things to try and change man and society, some have limited value, I guess. But really, it all stems from the heart of man. If you're born again, truly born again and in love with Jesus, if everybody was that, there would be no, and that's what heaven's going to be like. There's going to be no crime. There's going to be no contention. There's going to be no problems. Everything's going to be perfect. 
Jesus is the only way that that can happen. And the spirit of Antichrist is to oppose the person of Jesus Christ. And therefore, our job as the church should be the exact opposite, to proclaim him and uphold him. Matthew 5, 14 to 16 says this, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That's us, church. We are that light. It's saying, don't, don't hide under the bed. <laughs> don't pull the curtains. Let your light shine. Stand up. Speak out. Make a difference. That's what our light, making our light shine means. And as I say, it's not always going to be hard, but we have to stand up. There should be no closet Christians. Now, we're lucky in this nation. We don't have to fear physical um, abuse, um, although it might come. Uh, like perhaps they do up in Bangladesh, where you, you promote your faith there, make a stand, you're, you're in danger of death. No question about it. And there are martyrs happening all around the world uh, who are standing up for Jesus and giving their lives for his cause. Now, we haven't come to that extreme here in this nation. But um, I don't know about you, but I have already been ridiculed. Um, we might be abused. We would possibly be threatened. That's just the nature of where we're living. But as 1 Peter 3, 14 to 7 says, but even if you should suffer for doing what, right, what is right, remember you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But revere Christ. Revere in your hearts Christ as Lord. If you really honor and revere and love and esteem him highly in your heart, which is we all should, I'm sure you all do. Then it goes on to say this. Then it says, always be prepared. Always, not sometimes, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that you have. But do it with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will for you to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And Jesus said himself, didn't he? He said in Matthew 10, 33, he said, whoever denies me before men, he said, I'll deny them before the Father. Boy, that's, <laughs> that's a pretty sobering scripture, I tell you. I'm not quite sure how that works, but um, to be honest, uh, maybe there's a whole teaching in that one day. But uh, we need to stand up, church, for righteousness. We need to um, stand up for Jesus. Oh, I've got a lot more to say. <laughs> I don't know. I'm preaching. It. Oh, man. Okay, I think what we might do, uh, I think we might uh, uh, break the sermon down into two parts. I was going to talk about prayer next week because um, people say, well, you're you know, really sure all we should do is pray. And, uh, and Jude doesn't mention that in the scriptures that we should pray. Uh, but of course we should, and uh, I was going to bring a whole teaching on that aspect of, of making our stand, if you like, of contending for our faith in the prayer realm uh, next week. But I haven't really got to what I wanted to say this, this week yet, uh, so I think we'll just um, we'll call this as a little bit of an appetizer or an entree, but don't you dare not come next week, because I really, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, got to get to the main point yet, but, and I'll just give you a little bit of a preview, all right? Um, I said I was only going to preach for 40 minutes today, and that time's up. So, goodness me, it's hard. <laughs> so you, you prepare for a message. I tell you, church, you don't know, it's pretty hard. You prepare for a message and you think, what if I run out of things to say? I'm standing there, you know, never the case. <laughs> Where's you prepare? Think, well, I haven't got enough. So I tend to get more scriptures and more information and sometimes it's not needed. Um, but uh, And that's exactly what I've done now. I've, uh, I'm probably only halfway. So we'll continue next week. But just to give you an idea, uh, in the book of Jude, and that's really what we're looking at. That's our foundation for, for, for this teaching. Um, we're looking um, at, the, at, the, at the chapter or the verse. It's only one chapter. It's one, 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 one verse, uh, one chapter in the book of Jude. The whole of the chapter really just continues on about all the warnings and all these troubles and all these things that you should contend for. But then it finishes in verse 20, or near the finish. It gets in verse 20. And he said, 
And it says this, and we'll just have a look at this to give you a bit of a, a, um, a, a glimpse of next week's message. It says in verse 20, but you, dear friends, so having said all these negative things and moaning and groaning and saying, watch out, watch out, contend, 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 but you, dear friends, it said, this is what you need to do. So here's some answers. Here's some practical answers. We've already talked about standing up, okay, for Jesus and for, 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 the, for the moral values, but it says, dear friends, build yourselves up. It says four things. Firstly, it says, build yourselves up in your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt and save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by their corrupted flesh. So next week, there's four things there that Jesus he mentions mercy twice, but there's, so there's basically four things that Jude mentions there that we should do. And they're very relevant. When I thought about them, I thought, wow, yeah, actually, they will really help us as we contend for our faith. The first one is building ourselves up in our faith by praying in the Holy Spirit, praying in tongues. So I'll talk a bit about that. We need to be strong in our spirit man. In our flesh, we can't do this. We can't contend to make the stand that we need to just in our, in our, in our, in our flesh, in our natural nature. We need the power of the spirit, the power of the spirit. You look at Peter. I'm starting to preach again. We, the, the, you look at Peter, okay? You look at him before he, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Gospels. He was, yeah, Jesus, yeah, Jesus. But Jesus said to him, hey, hang on, mate. You're going to deny me three times before the old rooster crows. No, no, not me, not me. He was willing. He wanted to, just like all of us. I'm sure we all want to do the right thing. But when push came to shove and he was confronted by people, what did he do? Did he contend for the faith? No, he denied Jesus three times, just as Jesus says. We don't want to be like that, but we don't need to be. Because then we read in Acts chapter 2 that Peter was in the upper room. The Holy Spirit came. They all got filled with the Spirit. And you look at Peter's ministry after that. He was bold, 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 didn't hold back, never denied Jesus. In fact, he ended up giving his life for a savior. That's why we need the Spirit. That's why we need the Spirit. We cannot, cannot make a stand just in our own strength. And then second point he makes is that we've got to keep ourselves in God's love. So we're not fighting people here. We must love people. And I want to talk about that. This is very important. We can come here and we can criticize and we can judge. No, 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 no. We've got to love people. And, but I want to talk to you a little bit about what that love looks like. And then we're going to look at the other thing that he says in, in chapter, in verse 20 there. He said that he says to um, show mercy to those who doubt. People are deceived. They don't know any better. They doubt. We've got to show mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And that's what God's called us to do. And then the last thing that he says to do, save others by snatching them from the fire. In other words, they're all heading to hell. And we've got a job to snatch them from the fire. And I want to spend most of my time next week talking about that because it's all to do with proclaiming the gospel. It's the gospel that is the power of God under salvation and that can save them and snatch them from the fire.